Welcome back to the show, costume designer Ellen Mirajnik. How are we doing today, Ellen? We're doing just fine. Ellen, thanks for joining us again. Ken Stoffer, of course, from Ocean Zographer Online too. How are you doing today, Ken? I'm doing well. Thank you. Great. Well, we covered quite a bit in the last episode, but we missed off some heavy hitters from your filmography, Ellen. And we're going to dive straight into Cocktail, one of my favorites. And, well, I guess my question to you, Ellen, about Cocktail <laughs> uh, <laughs> she's shaking her head for anyone listening. Um, well, we've spoken to a couple of costume designers on the show before, um, Betsy Hyman and Marlene Stewart, about working with Tom Cruise. And they both mentioned that he's fantastic, always available for fittings, um, but never misses a trick, always pays every bit of attention to every facet of the filmmaking. Uh, I just want to ask, really, what the experience was like working with Tom for you on that? Well, that was, a very, that was a very young Tom. Tom mm -hmm. had was only. I think in his 20s, I don't think he was much older. He'd done a, a few films. Um, I think that I worked with him as his on his first film as in a, I think a sub very, very, very like one day part. Um, mm -hmm. I was an assistant on Endless Love and he was one of the kids in the, in the high school, I believe. But mm -hmm. then many years later come Cocktail, um, I think he'd done a, a few films and this film had come up and um, they were hoping for a success. The film was a little um, kind of messy, but Tom is the consummate professional. It didn't matter that he was 20 something years old he was always very present very much on it he's always a pleasure to be with and deal with and um he was he wasn't as skilled as he is now of course in the process of of um making a film and being part of the producing element of of filmmaking but he was he was the lead actor and um, he was great. Cool. Well, I mean, so many of the printed shirts. We've got a friend who also runs another site who's addicted to Hawaiian shirts, tropical shirts, and, and the like. Those shirts happen to be, I think, far better than any, I mean, in my opinion, far better than any Hawaiian shirts on the market then or now. Mm. And because I don't think that they were really like Hawaiian shirts. They were done by a company, which I forget, of course, the name right now, um, in New York, who did magnificent shirts. It was not only in the print, but it was in the cut of the fabric and the cut of the shirt itself that made it so special. And um, it, it just had a feeling of a more tropical atmosphere. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Well, we got a got next on the list, Jacob's Ladder. Yes. Oh yeah, we want um, to get your favorite. Well, I love Jacob's Ladder. It's probably yeah. one of my favorite films that I've ever done. Uh, again, an Adrian Line film, and um, it was a really interesting film because when it was done, Adrian, um, who is a man, uh, who is a filmmaker who works in the moment as opposed to making full plans of, of storyboards and shots and how he's going to complete it and what a visual effect would be. And it was at the very beginning of visual effects and, mm -hmm. and um, visual effects that you would create after the film was done. And he was quite opposed to going down that road. And so um, there's a fellow that I always worked with uh, named Richard Dean, who was a brilliant makeup artist at that time and uh, always in his whole entire career. But he and I were great collaborators. And what we did for him, Adrian, was we created, um, we hired a, an actor and created makeup effects in different kinds of, of um, entrapments, whether it be plastic, whether it be different kind of outside elements and so on, to create an effect to show Adrian what could be done practically, if not wanting to make a choice at later on about um, later on about about um, a visual effect that he could create 
you know, without, you know, in post-production. Anyway, it was quite successful because his inspiration was um, Joel, um, it's Joel Peter Witkin, his shaking man, and he, everything had a kind of a blurred and shaky image. And yeah. in other words, it wasn't for fear it or shock value. It was for distortion and strangeness more. And so that was, it was quite a great exercise to help um, kind of lay a foundation for the film. Yeah, I, ju I just watched it last night for the first time. It's really interesting. Film. It's a really interesting film. I think the unfortunate part of the film for me is as after it was done is that I wish the ending was different. Mm -hmm. That's that's I think that's where I think that would have been that was the mark of is it interesting or is it great? You yeah. know. It is a little grim, yeah. yeah. Um, and I think I, that after you go through that entire, entire story to wind up there is a little mm. uh, short-sighted. I'm, I'm a little embarrassed how long it took me to figure out what was going on, given the title of the film. But yes. <laughs> um, I am curious, because it, it's set in like 1970s, very grimy New York, which I guess you lived in at that time. Um, is it... Is it different doing a period piece for such a recent period, ninety, like fifteen years on, as opposed to like when you're doing Chaplin and you know you're sixty, seventy years later? No, I don't think it's different. I think that maybe the only difference really would be what's available to you. Mm -hmm. What do you, where, what, how, and when can you actually secure? Um, or find different pieces that would be great to use in the film. Mm. That's, that's the only difference I think. Yeah. And I, also, I mean, but then again, you have to think also about how is it going to be captured? How is it going to be shot? And um, is it going to um, create a feeling that is beyond what you're shooting and, and so on. And I think that, when we shot that film, I really don't think that New York was slick. You right. Know? So it, and we were in Brooklyn a lot of the time, and I don't really think that anything was trendy and cool or any of what we know today was in in our way. You mm -hmm. know, so it actu all of it actually worked pretty um, organically. Gotcha. And uh, just to let me handle this transition, Pete. Um, uh, Adrian Lyon, as you were saying uh, on the last call, um, very th there's a real honesty in the emotion uh, of his character. Um, mm -hmm. Nothing feels forced. There's obviously sexuality in this film and in like Unfaithful, um, mm -hmm. Fatal Attraction, but it, it's never exploitative or anything like that. Um, and so now let's jump to uh, Paul Verhoeven and Basic Instinct, kind of the Paul. Well, that's quite a different story now, isn't it? Yeah, we've got to switch gears. <laughs> Extremely truthful and really, really um, vibrant director, without a question of a doubt. And he knows yeah. exactly where he's going, what he's doing, and pretty much how he wants to get there without interference, without mm -hmm. interference. Um, all of these directors work without interference because we didn't live in a time where anything was a committee, mm -hmm. you know, so... In any event, that was kind of thrilling by, in hindsight. Uh, Paul is very, very clear on what his objective is. Um, he relies on his visual interpreters for what it will appear, what the story will appear like. Mm -hmm. But he's a very truthful, very direct, very aggressive filmmaker. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah. I think you could find that in all of his work, yeah. you know, whether I worked with him or not, you could find it from his very beginning of his European films, mm -hmm. all through everything he made in the United States, through what he is doing now. Mm -hmm. um, he's an artist. And I think that he has, he actually has that multi brain where it's not only art, 
but it's science and math and music on top of it. So he he has a lot going for him mm -hmm. when he interprets the material or how he wants to interpret the material. Mm -hmm. I found him quite stimulating to work with. Well, on our last call, Ellen, I mistakenly assumed that basic instinct um, and fatal attraction and and Wall Street were the beginnings of Saruti. But was it Saruti that came on board for basic Saruti instinct? Saruti no, did not um, any no one project I worked on. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. It's amazing that that rumor has just kind of spread like wildfire. Well, it's dead. I don't know where you found that rumor, but it's not been alive for many, many years. <laughs> well, um, I know there's no need to spread it any further. Yeah, let's not give it the oxygen of publicity. But we do yeah. need to talk about this. Um, sorry, Cam, we've got to, got to get this one in here. There it is. <laughs> That's my, one of my favorite costumes of all time, because when I was watching this as a young boy, and this is Michael Douglas turning up to this, the nightclub in Basic Instinct, we all assume as young men that we could get away with wearing uh, over in Phoenix sweaters and, <laughs> and uh, lure the likes of Sharon Stone into our arms. But um, perhaps just also perhaps talk about what it was like working on that film and, and dressing Michael Douglas in particular at that point. Um, well, it, it was great to work on that film. It was really very, very clear what we had to do and how we would go about doing it. Um, all the actors were perfectly great. There was a plan ahead and, and we executed very much to what we had hoped to achieve. Um, there was, in that costume particularly, and in her costume that she wears in that same scene, mm -hmm. what the choice for that costume was made for, for a reason. And that was that in their dance number, it had to be a kind of costume where during their dance and that choreography, she was able to put her, slip her hand gracefully underneath his sweater at his neck. And he was able to put his hand through the back of her dress. And subsequently it was designed to have a very low um, back. And it's only for those two reasons that those two choices were um the impetus to to make those choices, I I should say. That's fascinating. That's um, and I assume that Sharon writes you a letter every month thanking you for that white dress in that scene. <laughs> in the entire yes, absolutely. Made her famous. Yeah. I heard she took it home and the coat as well. She didn't take it home. I had uh, it. You had it. it. Oh, Amazing. Wow. But it's it, I don't know where it is right now, but it was it was at auction and it went to the it went to somebody who donated quite a lot of money for charity wow. well moving on from the basic instinct dress well actually on that i had a question ellen back in those days maybe through the 90s i, I think it was probably a, a little bit easier for actors and actresses to actually walk home with their clothes especially if they were made for them and their fit but nowadays i don't think it's as no, easy. It was always up to the producer. It didn't, mm. I mean, since I've been working, it was always up to the producer. Mm. It was never up to the actor. The actor couldn't just take what they wanted. Not right. at all. Yeah. It's not part of the process. I mean, the, the clothes need to stay there till a film is in the first cut and what, what might be needed and so on. And you can't just willy nilly give stuff to actors who might not know where it is if you need it again. Yeah. Mm. Actually, uh, Peter, if I can just jump ahead here real quick. I, I heard a story about Douglas on A Perfect Murder. Um, mm -hmm. By the way, I, that is one of the most, like the wardrobe in that film is some of the most beautiful I've ever seen. Thank you. Um, Thank you. I, I still well. refer back to that film all the time. Um, the tuxedo he's wearing right there in that shot, uh, I heard that he did hold on to, and he was going to wear a few years later in his wedding to Catherine Zeta-Jones. but. Mm -hmm. She found out like a couple of days before and nixed the idea because of like a bad vibe. Like she didn't want to get murdered. <laughs> I don't um, think that was the case. 
okay. Uh, maybe, maybe it's just exaggerated at this point, but um, such such beautiful work in that. Is it, um, those are are those Anto shirts he's wearing? I know. Yes, right? yes, yes, yes. Okay. Yes. And were the suits? And I think Dominic made the suits. That was my next question. Okay. Dominic made his whole wardrobe, and it. I think that his wardrobe in this film is undeniably so classic and beautiful. And Dominic just, he absolutely was an artist in a silhouette and creating proportion perfectly yeah. for the actor that he was cutting for and, and, and using the fabrication that it was made. And he was always, his eye and his talent was supreme, really supreme. Yeah, it really comes through too, boy. Mm. I saw that once and it was a great film. I remember loving it, but I was on a first date watching that and the date didn't go well. And so I've never <laughs> returned to the film because I don't want to pick up that scab and remind myself of how bad the date was. But I would imagine it didn't go that well. <laughs> Loved the movie though. I'll have to give it another visit. I'm over it now. I don't know, I want to fast forward a little and show you a clip that I, that I pulled and Love that movie. And yeah, who knew he fun. could dance like that, right? He was, he's qu quite great. He's quite great. I think that he could do anything that he wants to do if he's, if his, if he puts his mind to it, he wants to do it. And I heard on, again, through a scurrilous source that the wardrobe in that film, like he was wearing black a lot of the time wearing through that film and Helen Hunt's Maybe. wearing white. Uh, Navy. Navy. And so like there was kind of like contrast going on there between the characters and then they come together towards the end and almost look like they're pairing in the same palette. Was that by design? Was that an accident? You know, it's I, I, I nothing is ever an accident. Nothing mm. is an accident. I, I mean, w when creating a contemporary film, um, I, I happen to really love working in contemporary film. Uh, haven't done quite some time, but uh, at a a lot of my career, um, up to about I guess twenty twelve ish twenty thirteen, stayed in contemporary film. And contemporary film, I think, is the hardest film to design. There isn't anything that is really harder. There's a lot of opinions. There's a lot of judgments. There's a lot of talk. And um, there's a lot that goes into it. And it's not just about shopping and it's not just about buying the nicest thing or even bespoking the, the best possible choice of anything. A lot of, a lot of time and effort and concentration goes into every piece of clothing that's, that you use to create the character that's before you and that's in the text. And when it came to Mel Gibson's character um, and Helen Hunt's character, um, it was about creating that, what, that, what, um, it was about creating what Nancy wrote as far as who they were and what they were. And there were choices made that would be appropriate for each scene. As it came out, and it was, I mean, towards the end, as it was knitted together, um, there weren't things that were so stylized that we said, okay, he's gonna be in black, she's gonna be in white. We're gonna tell another story. No, no, no. I mean, it's it. sometimes you do that. I mean, I always lay everything out before me and see how the film will run without a question. But in that case, you know, I'd have to try to really, really remember if certain things were done purposely. What was done purposely was creating the character first and foremost, his character first and foremost, and creating her character first and foremost, because she had not played a leading lady of that stature for, I, I don't know if she ever did create, if she did ever play that kind of character. I worked with her once on Twister, 
Mm. But that was a different character, totally different character. And I think that um, she hadn't played kind of a glamorous character yeah. as a leading lady. Yeah. And so that that required a different mindset in, in, in trying to actually present her the best in the best possible light. And I remember at the time thinking watching this film that Mel Gibson, when he's in the end, he's doing like the chivalrous thing, trying to get other people's lives back on track, especially the people whose lives he, he might have interfered with. He has a like a, a raincoat or a like a trench coat. And I always thought whilst watching that, I was getting lots of uh, Jimmy Stewart vibes at the same time. I don't know if my mind is reaching and trying to connect the dots. No, I, I mean, even... that's perfectly fine. You know, I, who knows? This is one thing that's true, okay? There's lo there are lots of images that kind of subliminally sit in in your library in your in in your being right and things things get kind of there there's subtle references that you don't even reference you don't even use as a as a direct reference but there are certain things that i pay quite a lot of attention to the choreography of scenes and what has to happen guys it's never about the clothes for me ever mm -hmm. Ever, 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 ever. It's what's going on in that scene. Mm -hmm. What is the choreography? What what needs to be fluid? What needs to be the opposite? What actually is necessary to create the right um, tone at that moment seamlessly mm -hmm. so that while watching the film, the audience just feels it. It's not put, you know, it's not like, hit over they're not hit over the head with it and those directors who do have quite a high aesthetic we usually relate quite well nancy's nancy myers um has a, an aesthetic that is bar none like one of the highest and the best um her taste level is so high and will not accept anything less than great interesting well, yeah, I mean, like you say, I think guys, and maybe I'm just going to be a bit broad here for a sec, guys, when they look at films and clothes, especially nowadays, they look to garner their own style template and go like, well, Ryan Gosling's wearing this jacket. Where can I buy that jacket? And they, they almost want to look for a brand. I mean, I know Ken and I were quite... Well, that's, that's very, it's very different now than it is, was then. Mm. You know, I mean, yeah. although... Over the course of my career, I can't tell you how many times people have been in touch to say, I want that. Where am I? I still get like questions of films like from 25 years ago. And people <laughs> really expect me to remember a pair of sunglasses. Like but, Cliffhanger? <laughs> yes, like Cliffhanger. Nobody ever asked about that. But that said, only you. Only you would um, that being said, no, no, no hard feelings there. Um, <laughs> being said, it's it's very the movies are a great communicator. They're com on many, many different levels, whether it is what you're saying, how you're saying it, whether it's what it looks like, where it takes place, what the characters are wearing, what hits that zeitgeist moment. And that's really the indication of did it work? For, I, I I feel that is that how does the every person that sees the film react to it? Mm -hmm. What do they take away and what do they identify best with? I want to mm -hmm. be that guy. I want to be that girl. I don't want to have anything to do with it. I want to live in that kind of house. I love that color. Mm -hmm. I want to be just like him, just like that hero, just like the anti-hero, et cetera. Mm -hmm. and, and usually when that happens, it is it really tells you a lot about the temperature of the society of where we're at in the world. Right, like the Gordon Gecko, you realize that. So like many the Gordon Gecko. I mean, you think of Gordon Gecko, you think of in this day and age, um, euphoria, you think of... Mm -hmm. 
in this day, I didn't do Euphoria, but I did Bridgerton and Bridgerton is like, it just hit a zeitgeist that was bigger than anything that I've ever done. I mean, right. worldwide. Right. Not yeah. that it was the biggest, it, well, it was probably the biggest production, but it hit a zeitgeist that was, holy mo. I mean, it was from one end of the world to the other end of the world, mm -hmm. back north, south, east, west, doesn't matter where it was. It just, they went, you know, the, the audience went wild. Mm -hmm. So you kind of know what is going on, I think, in society when things get that type of reaction, even if it's just Gordon Gecko, It just, mm -hmm. it tells you what is going on yeah. in society.